Hi, it's Miss Lisa from the St. Paris Public Library. Today is the third day for our Pippi Longstocking uh, book for our Just Before Bed. So uh, grab a nice seat and let's sit down and read a couple more chapters. Chapter 5. Pippi Sits on the Gate and Climbs a Tree Outside Villa Villa Coola sat Pippi, Tommy, and Annika. Pippi sat on one gate post, Annika on the other, and Tommy sat on the gate. It was a warm and beautiful day towards the end of August. A pear tree had, that grew close to the fence stretched its branches so low down that the children could sit and pick the best little red gold pears without any trouble at all. They munched and ate and spit pear cores out onto the road. Villa Villa Coola stood just on the edge of the little town where the street turned into a country road. The people in the little town loved to go walking out Villa Villa Coola way for the country out there was so beautiful. As the children were sitting there eating pears, a girl came walking along the road from town. When she saw the children, she stopped and asked, Have you seen my papa go by? Hmm, said Pippi. How did he look? Did he have blue eyes? Yes, said the girl. Medium large, not too tall, not too short. Yes, said the girl. Black hat and black shoes. Yes, exactly, said the girl eagerly. No, that one we haven't seen, said Pippi decidedly. The girl looked crestfallen and went off without a word. Wait a minute, shrieked Pippi after her. Was he ball headed? No, he certainly was not, said the girl crossly. Lucky for him, said Pippi, and spit out a pear core. The girl hurried away, but then Pippi shouted, Did he have big ears and reach way down to his shoulders? No, said the girl, and turned and came running back in amazement. You don't mean to say that you have seen a man walking by with such big ears? I have never seen anyone who walks with his, ear, walks with his ears, said Pippi. All the people I know walk with their feet. Oh, don't be silly. I mean, have you really seen a man who has such big ears? No, said Pippi. There isn't anybody with such big ears. It would be ridiculous. How would they look? It, is, it isn't possible to have such big ears, at least not in this country, she added after a thoughtful pause. Of course, in China, it's a little different. I once saw a Chinese in Shanghai. His ears were so big that he could use them for a cape. When it rained, he just crawled in under his ears and was as warm and snug as you please. Of course, his ears didn't have to have it so good. If it was very bad weather, he used to invite his friends to camp under his ears. There they sat and sang sad songs while the rain poured down. They linked him. They liked him a lot because of his ears. His name was Hai Shang. You should have seen Hai Shang run to work in the morning. He always came dashing in at the last minute because he loved to sleep late. And you can't imagine how funny he looked, rushing in with his ears flying behind him like two big golden sails. The girl had stopped and stood open-mouthed listening to Pippi. And Tommy and Annika forgot to eat any more pears. They were so utterly absorbed in the story. He had more children than he could count, and the littlest one was named Peter, said Pippi. Oh, but a Chinese baby can't be called Peter, interrupted Tommy. That's just what his wife said to him. A Chinese baby can't be called Peter. But Shang, but Hai Shang was dreadfully stubborn, and he said that the baby should be called Peter or nothing. And then he sat down in a corner and pulled his ears over his head and howled. And his poor wife had to give in, of course, and the kid was called Peter. Really, said Annika. It was the hatefulest kid in all Shanghai, continued Pippi, fussy about his food so that his mother was most unhappy. You know, of course, that they eat swallow's nest in China, and there sat his mother with a whole plate full of swallow's nest trying to feed him. Now, little Peter, she said, come, we'll eat a swallow's nest for daddy. But Peter just shut his mouth tight and shook his head. At last, Hai Shang was so angry that he said that no new food should be prepared for Peter until he has eaten a swallow's nest for daddy. And when Hai Shang said something that that was that, the same swallow's nest rode in and out of the kitchen from May until October. On the 4th of July, his mother begged to be allowed to give Peter a couple of meatballs, but Hai Shang said no. Nonsense, said the girl in the road. Yes, that's just what Hang Hai Shang said, continued Pippi. Nonsense, he said. It's perfectly plain the child can eat the swallow's nest if he'll only stop being so stubborn. 
but Peter kept his mouth shut tight from May to October. But how could he live? asked Tommy, astonished. He couldn't live, said Pippi. He died of plain, common, ordinary pig-headedness the 18th of October and was buried the 19th, and on the 20th a swallow flew in through the window and laid an egg in the nest, which was standing on the table. So it came in handy after all. No harm done, said Pippi happily. Then she looked thoughtfully at the bewildered girl who still stood in the road. Why do you look so funny, asked Pippi. What's the matter? You don't really think that I'm sitting here telling lies, do you? Just tell me if you do, said Pippi, threateningly and rolling up her sleeves. Oh, no, indeed, said the girl, terrified. I don't really mean that you are lying, but... No, said Pippi, but it's just that I'm doing... It's just what I... But it's just what I'm doing. I'm lying, so my tongue is turning black. Do you really think that a child can live without food from May to October? To be sure, I know they can get along without food for three or four months, all right. But from May to October, it's just foolish to think that. You must know that it's a lie. You mustn't let people fool you fool you so easily. Then the girl left without turning around again. People will believe anything, said Pippi to Tommy and Annika. From May until October, that's ridiculous. Then she called after the girl. No, we haven't seen your papa. We haven't seen a single ball-headed person all day, but yesterday 17 of them went by arm in arm. Pippi's garden was really lovely. You couldn't say it was well kept, but there were wonderful grass plots that were never cut and old rose bushes that were full of white and yellow and pink roses. Perhaps not such fine roses, but oh, how sweet they smelled. A good many fruit trees grew there too, and best of all, several ancient oaks and elms that were excellent for climbing. And the trees in Tommy's and Annika's garden were not very good for climbing, and besides, their mother was always so afraid they would fall and get hurt that they had never climbed much. But now, Pippi said, suppose we climb up in the big oak tree. Tommy jumped down from the gate at once, delighted with the suggestion. Annika was a little hesitant, but when she saw that the trunk had nubs, nubbly places to climb on, she thought she too thought it would be fun to try. A few feet above the ground, the ground, the oak divided into two branches. The right and right there was a place just like a little room. Before long, all three children were sitting there. Over their heads, the oak spread out its crown like a great green roof. We could drink coffee here, said Pippi. I'll skip in and make a little. Tommy and Annika clapped their hands and shouted, Bravo! In a little while, Pippi had the coffee ready. She had made buns the day before. She came and stood under the oak and began to toss up coffee cups. Tommy and Annika caught them, only sometimes it was the oak that caught them, and it, so two cups were broken. Pippi ran in to get two new ones. Next, it was the bun's turn, and for a while the air was full of flying buns. At least they didn't break. At last, Pippi climbed up with the coffee pot in one hand. She had cream in a little bottle in her pocket and sugar in a little box. Tommy and Annika thought coffee had never tasted so good before. They were not allowed to drink it every day, only when they were at a party. And now they were at a party. Annika spilled a little coffee in her lap. First it was warm and wet, then it was cold and wet, but that didn't matter to her. When they had finished, Pippi threw the cups on the grass. I want to see how strong the china they make these days is, she said. Strangely enough, one cup and three saucers held together, and only the spout of the coffee pot broke off. Presently, Pippi decided to climb a little higher. Can you beat this, she cried suddenly. The tree is hollow. There, in the trunk, was a big hole, which the leaves had hidden from the children's sight. Oh, may I climb up and look, too, called Tommy, but there was no answer. Pippi, where are you? She, he, wor he cried, worried. Then they heard Pippi's voice, not from above, but from way down below. It sounded as if it came from under the ground. I'm inside the tree. It is hollow, clear down to the ground. If I peek out through a little crack, I can see the coffee pot outside on the grass. Oh, how will you get up again, cried Annika. I'm never coming up, said Pippi. I'm going to stay here until I retire and get a pension, and then you'll have to throw my food down through the hole up here. Five or six times a day, Annika began to cry. 
Why be sorry? Why complain? said Pippi. You come down here too, and then we can play. That we are pining away in a dungeon. Never in this world, said Annika, and to be on the safe side, she climbed right down out of the tree. Annika, I can see you through the crack, cried Pippi. Don't step on the coffee pot. It's an old, well-mannered coffee pot and never did anyone any harm. It can't, I, it can't help but that it doesn't have a spout any longer. Annika went up to the tree trunk and through a little crack she saw the very tip of Pippi's finger. This comforted her a great deal, but she was still worried. Pippi, can't you really get up, she asked. Pippi's finger disappeared and in less than a minute her face popped out the hole up in the tree. Maybe if I can, I maybe I can if I try very hard, she said, and parted the foliage with her hands. If it's as easy as all that to get up, said Tommy, who was still up in the tree, then I want to come down and pine away a little too. Wait, said Pippi, I think we'll get a ladder. She crawled out of the hole and hurried down the tree. Then she ran after a ladder, pushed it up the tree, and let it down into the hole. Tommy was wild to go down. It was difficult to climb to the hole because it was so high up, but Tommy was brave, and he wasn't afraid to climb down into the dark hollow of the trunk. Annika watched him disappear and wonder if she would ever see him again. She peeked in through the crack. Annika, came Tommy's voice. You can't imagine how wonderful it is in here. You must have, You must come in too. It isn't the least bit dangerous when you have a ladder to climb on. If you only do it once, you'll never want to do anything else. Are you sure? asked Annika. Absolutely, said Tommy. With trembling legs, Annika climbed up in the tree again, and Pippi helped her with the the last hard bit. She drew back a little when she saw how dark it was in the tree trunk, but Pippi held her hand and kept encouraging her. Don't be scared, Annika, she heard Tommy say from down below. Now I can see your legs, and I'll certainly catch you if you fall. But Annika didn't fall. She reached Tommy safely, and a moment later, Pippi followed. Isn't it grand here, said Tommy, and Annika had to admit that it was. It wasn't nearly so dark as she thought, because light came in through the crack. She peeked through and announced that she too could see the coffee pot outside on the grass. We'll have this for our secret hiding place, said Tommy. Nobody will know that we are here, and if they should come and hunt around outside for us, we can see them through the crack, and we'll have a good laugh. We can have a little stick and poke it out through the crack and tickle them, and then they'll think the place is haunted, said Pippi. At this idea the, idea, the children were so delighted that they hugged each other, all three. Then they heard the ding-dong that meant the bell was ringing for dinner at Tommy and Annika's house. Oh, bother, said Tommy. Now we've got to go home, but we'll come back. We'll come over tomorrow as soon as we get back from school. Do that, said Pippi. And so they climbed up the ladder, and first Pippi, then Annika, and Tommy last. And then they climbed down out of the tree, first Pippi, then Annika, and Tommy last. Chapter 6. Pippi Arranges a Picnic We didn't have any school today because we're having scrubbing vacation, said Tommy to Pippi. Scrubbing vacation? Well, I like that, said Pippi. Another injustice. Do I get any scrubbing vacation? Indeed, I don't. Though goodness knows I need one. Just look at the kitchen floor. But for that matter, she added, now I come to think of it. I can scrub without any vacation, and that's what I intend to do right now. Scrubbing vacation or no scrubbing vacation? I'd like to see anybody stop me. You two sit on the kitchen table out of the way. Tommy and Annika obediently climbed up on the kitchen table, and Mr. Nilsen, remember Mr. Nilsen was the monkey, hopped up after them and went to sleep in Annika's lap. Pippi heated a big kettle of water and without more ado poured it onto the kitchen floor. She took off her big shoes and laid them neatly on the bread plate. She tied two scrubbing brushes on her bare feet and skated over the floor, plowing through the water so that it splashed all around her. I certainly should have been a skating princess, she said, and kicked her left foot up so high that the scrubbing brush broke a piece out of the overhead light. Grace and charm I have at least, she continued, and skipped nimbly over a chair standing in her way. Well, now I guess it's clean, she said at last, and took off the brushes. 
Aren't you going to dry the floor? asked Annika. Oh no, it can dry in the sun, answered Pippi. I don't think it will catch cold so long as it keeps moving. Tommy and Annika climbed down from the table and stopped, stepped across the floor very carefully so that they wouldn't get wet. Out of the door, the sun shone in the clear blue sky. It was one of those radiant September days that made you feel like walking in the woods. Pippi, walking in the woods. Pippi had an idea. Let's take Mr. Nilsson and go on a little picnic. Oh, yes, cried Tommy and Annika. Run home and ask your mother then, said Pippi, and I'll be getting the picnic basket ready. Tommy and Annika thought that was a good, good suggestion. They rushed home and were back again almost immediately, but Pippi was already waiting by the gate with Mr. Nilsson on her shoulder, a walking stick in one hand and a big basket in the other. The children walked along the road a little ways and then turned into a pasture where a pleasant path wound in and out among the thickets of birch and hazel. Presently, they came to a gate on the other side, of which was an even more beautiful pasture, but right in front of the gate stood a cow who looked as if nothing would persuade her to move. Anneke yelled at her, and Tommy bravely went up and tried to push her out of the way, but she just stood there, staring at the children with her big cow eyes. To put an end to the matter, Pippi set down her basket and lifted the cow out of the way. You remember that Pippi has like superhuman strength. She's very strong for a little girl. The cow looked very silly, lumbered off into the and and lumbered off into the hazel bushes. How can cows be so bullheaded? said Pippi and jumped over the gate. What a lovely, lovely wood, cried Annika in delight as she climbed up on the stone she could see. Tommy had brought along a dagger Pippi had given him, and with it he cut walking sticks for Annika and for himself. He cut his thumb a little too, but it didn't matter. Maybe we ought to pick some mushrooms, said Pippi, and she broke off a pretty rosy one. I wonder if it's possible to eat it, she continued. At any rate, it isn't possible to drink it, that much I know, so there is no choice except to eat it. Maybe it's possible. She took a big bite and swallowed it. It was possible, she announced, delighted. Yes, sirree, we'll certainly stew the rest of this sometime, she said, and threw it high over the treetops. What have you got in your basket, asked Annika. Is it something good? I wouldn't tell you for a thousand dollars, said Pippi. First, we must find a good picnic spot. The children eagerly began to look for such a place. Annika found a large flat stone that she thought was satisfactory, but it was covered with red ants. I don't want to sit with them, said Pippi, because I'm not acquainted with them. And besides, they bite, said Tommy. Do they, said Pippi? Bite them back. Then Tommy found a little clearing among the hazel bushes, and he thought that would be a good place. Oh, no, that's not sunny enough for my freckles, said Pippi, and I do think freckles are so attractive. Farther on, they came to a hill that was easy to climb. On one side of the hill was a nice sunny rock, just like a little balcony, and there they sat down. Now shut your eyes while I set the table, said Pippi. Tommy and Annika squeezed their eyes as tightly shut as possible. They heard Pippi opening the basket and rattling paper. One, two, nineteen. Now you may look, said Pippi at last. They looked and they squealed with delight when they saw all the good things Pippi had spread on the bare rock. There were good sandwiches with meatballs and ham and a whole pile of sugared pancakes, several little brown sausages, and three pineapple puddings. For you see, Pippi had learned cooking from the, from the cook on her father's ship. Aren't scrubbing vacations grand, said Tommy with his mouth full of pancakes. We ought to have them every day. No, indeed. I'm not that anxious to scrub, said Pippi. It's fun to be sure, but not every day. That would be too tiresome. At last, the children were so full they could hardly move, and they sat still in the sunshine and just enjoyed it. I wonder if it's hard to fly, said Pippi, and looked dreamily over the edge of the rock. The rock sloped down very steeply below them, and it was a long way to the ground. Down, at least, one ought to be able to learn to fly, she continued. It must be harder to fly up. But you could begin with the easiest way. I do think I'll try. Oh, no, she's going to try to fly. No, Pippi, cried both Tommy and Annika. Oh, dear, Pippi, don't do it. But Pippi had already, was already standing at the edge. Fly, you foolish fly. 
Fly, and the foolish fly flew, she said, and just as she said it, said flew, she lifted her arms and took off into the air. In half a second, there was a thud. It was Pippi hitting the ground. Tommy and Annika lay on their stomachs and looked down at her, terrified. Pippi got up and brushed off her knees. I forgot to flap, she said joyfully, and I guess I had too many pancakes in my stomach. At that moment, the children noticed that Mr. Nielsen had disappeared. He had evidently gone off on a little expedition of his own. They remembered that they had last seen him contentedly chewing the picnic basket to pieces, but during Pippi's flying ex experiment, they had forgotten him, and now he was gone. Pippi was so angry that she threw her shoe into a big, deep pool of water. You should never take monkeys with you anywhere, she said. He should have been left at home to pick fleas off the horse. That would have served him right, she continued, wading out into the pool to get her shoe. The water reached up to her waist. It might as well, I might as well take advantage of this and wash my hair, said Pippi, and ducked her head under the water and kept it there so long that the water began to bubble. There, now, I've saved a visit to the hairdresser, she said contentedly, when at last she came up for air. She stepped out of the pool and put on her shoe. Then they went off to hunt for Mr. Nielsen. Hear, hear how it squishes when I walk, laughed Pippi. It says, claps, claps, in my dress, and squish, squish, in my shoes. Isn't that jolly? I think you ought to try it too, she said to Annika, who was walking along beside her with her lovely flaxen hair, pink dress, and a little white kid shoes. Some other time, said sensible Annika. They walked on. Mr. Nielsen certainly can be exasperating, said Pippi. He's always doing things like this. Once in Arabia, he ran away from me and took a position as a maidservant to an elderly widow. That baby, she's got some stories, doesn't she? That last was a lie, of course, she added after a pause. Tommy suggested they all three go in different directions and hunt. At first, Annika didn't want to be too because she was a little afraid. But Tommy said, you aren't a fraidy cat, are you? And of course, Annika couldn't tolerate such an insult. So off they all went. Tommy went through a field. Mr. Nilsson, he did not find, but he did find something else a bull. Or to be more exact, the bull found Tommy, and the bull did not like Tommy, for he was a very cross bull who was not at all fond of children. With his head down, he charged towards Tommy, bellowing fearfully. Tommy let out a terrified shriek that could be heard all through the woods. Pippi and Annika heard it and came running to see what was the matter. By that time, the bull had almost reached Tommy, who had fallen head over heels over a stump. What a stupid bull, said Pippi to Annika, who was crying uncontrollably. He ought to know he can't act like that. He'll get Tommy's white sailor suit all dirty. I'll have to go and talk some sense into that stupid animal. And off she started. She ran up and pulled the bull by the tail. Forgive me for breaking up the party, she said. Since she had given his tail a good hard pull, the bull turned around and saw a new child to catch on his horns. As I was saying, went on Pippi, Forgive me for breaking up, and also forgive me for breaking off. And with that, she broke off one of the bull's horns. It isn't the style to have two horns this year, she said. All the better bulls have just one horn, if any. And she broke off the other horn, too. As bulls have no feelings in their horns, this one didn't know what she had done. He charged at Pippi, and if she had been any other child, there would have been nothing left but a grease spot. Hey, hey, stop tickling me, shrieked Pippi. You can't imagine how ticklish I am. Hey, stop it or I'll die laughing. But the bull didn't stop. And at last, Pippi jumped up on his back and got a little rest. To be sure, she didn't get much because the bull didn't in the least approve of having Pippi on his back. He dodged about madly to get her off, but she clapped her legs. She clamped her knees and hugged on. The bull dashed up and down the field, bellowing so hard that smoke came out of his nostrils. Pippi laughed and shrieked and waved at Tommy and Annika, who stood a little distance away, trembling like aspen leaves. The bull whirled round and round, trying to throw Pippi. See me dancing with my little friend, cried Pippi, and kept her seat. At last, the bull was so tired that he laid down on the grass and wished 
but he'd never seen such a thing as a child. He had never thought children amounted to much anyway. Are you going to take a little nap now, asked Pippi politely. Then I won't disturb you. She got off his back and went over to Tommy and Annika. Tommy had cried a little. He had a cut on his on one arm, but Annika had bandaged it with her handkerchief so that it no longer hurt. Oh, Pippi, cried Annika excitedly. Shh, shh, whispered Pippi. Don't wake the bull. He's sleeping. If he wake, if, if he wake, if we wake him, he'll be fussy. But the next minute, without paying any attention to the bull and his nap, she was shrieking at the top of her lungs. Mr. Nielsen! Mr. Nielsen, where are you? We've got to go home. And believe it or not, there sat Mr. Nielsen up in a pine tree, sucking his tail and looking very lonely. It wasn't much fun for a little monkey to be left all alone in the woods. He skipped down from the pine and up on Pippi's shoulder, waving his little straw hat as he always did when he was very happy. Well, well, so you aren't going to be a maidservant aft this time, said Pippi, stroking his back. Oh, that was a lie, that's sure, she continued. But still, if it's true, how can it be, how can it be a lie, she argued. You wait and see. It's going to turn out that he was a maidservant in Arabia after all, and if that's the case, I know who's going to make the meatballs at our house hereafter. And then they strolled home, Pippi's dress still going claff, claff, and her shoes squish, squish. Tommy and Annika thought they had a wonderful day in spite of the bull, and they sang a song they had learned at school. It was really a summer song, but they thought it fitted very well, even if it was now nearly autumn. In the jolly summertime, through field and wood, we make our way. Nobody's sad, everybody's gay. We sing as we go, hola, hola. You who are young, come join in our song. Don't sit home moping all day long. Our song will swell through wood and dell and up to the mountaintop as well. In the jolly summertime, we sing as we go, hola, holo. Pippi sang too, but slightly different words. In the jolly summertime, through field and wood, I make my way. I do exactly as I wish. And when I walk, I go squish, 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 squish. And my old shoe, it's really true. Sometimes say chip and sometimes chew. For the shoe is wet, the bull sleeps yet. And I eat all the rice pudding I can get in the jolly summertime. I squish wherever I go. Squish show, squish show. All right, we'll see you tomorrow night for the next reading of Pippi Longstocking. <laughs>